So, Shane, I was, you know, leaving home yesterday and to come down to do a bunch of stuff and interview. And, and I, my husband says, so who are you interviewing tomorrow on the podcast? And I said, oh, I'm interviewing Dr. Shane O'Mara. He is a neuroscientist. He has written all these books. And one of his books is about the science of walking. And my husband looks at me and he goes, there is somebody that has studied the science of walking are you serious? And I said, yes, I know. Nobody understands what's actually happening in the brain and the benefit to the body and mood and to you psychologically to simply take a walk. And what I want to know is, what's been your most shocking discovery about walking? I, I think it's the last chapter of the book that uh, we underestimate the extent to which walking is a profoundly social activity. Um, we, we think of walking as just a, a simple means from getting from A to B, and uh, we underestimate dramatically how exquisitely attuned we are to each other when we walk, um, and we underestimate terribly how enjoyable walking together is. Um, and it, it, if you think about it, you know, humans uh, made our, our journey out of Africa, uh, you know, sort of 80 to 130,000 years ago. And we did it on foot. We didn't do it uh, using mechanized transport because we hadn't invented it. But, you know, that's only something we really invented in the last 50 or 100 years or whatever. Um, uh, so it's something we have to do together. We did it in groups. We did it in families. We did it in tribes. We did it in communities. And uh, to do that successfully means that everybody has to be paying attention to everybody else. People have to keep an eye out for danger. You have to, if you're walking at the edge of the group and you see a sudden movement in a bush, uh, you're going to have to quickly tell everybody that there's a tiger over there or the either either that uh, Shane or I'm going to shove you in the direction of the tiger and run. Exactly. Because, right? you know, to survive a tiger, all you have to do is run a little bit faster than the slowest person, as the old joke goes. It's true. And nobody that's listening to the podcast, but everybody on YouTube could see that I wore a orange and black striped sweater today. I look like a tiger. Um, Maybe that's what primed me to give that example. It could be. But you're right. And I also think in modern life, the fact that so many people are stuck at home working hybrid roles and you feel a sense of deep isolation, that you underestimate the difference that simply getting out even alone and walking in your neighborhood can have in you feeling connected. Yeah, no, that's for sure. And um... I think, you know, if you take those two different examples, you going for a walk by yourself or you going for a walk with others, there are clearly benefits to you from uh, the very fact of you going for a walk for yourself. Uh, it brings clarity of mind. Uh, it's certainly good for your health and all of those things. Uh, you may also happen to accidentally meet people when you're walking and you can talk to them, which is an easy thing to do. It's not so easy when you're driving uh, or cycling on a bike or whatever to do that. Um, but the benefit from walking with others, of course, arises from the fact that humans are intensely and immensely social animals. Mm. And uh, we get this uh, feeling that it, it's been given a variety of different names. But the one that I like is uh, effervescent assembly, which is the, the, the feeling of, of the dissolution between self and other when people are walking together in a common cause. And we humans are the only species that do this. You know, uh, no chimpanzee has ever uh, got um, up and gone on a protest march against the Alpha because they're unhappy with an edict that the Alpha has handed down. But uh, you see right throughout, uh, you know, look at the history of the US over the last 50 or 100 years. Uh, you've got the, those amazing marches that happened in, in uh, Washington. You've had the uh, astonishing civil rights marches uh, in the country next door, the UK. You had those huge uh, marches against uh, Brexit, uh, which uh, sadly were ineffectual, but nonetheless, a million people who gathered, who didn't know each other, gathered together and walked the streets of London to protest uh, a policy that they disagreed with. And we've had similar marches here uh, for all sorts of reasons. And humans are unique because we will do this together. Um, as I said, chimpanzees won't do it. Uh, tigers, whom we've spoken of a moment ago, uh, won't do it. Fire ants won't do it. This is something unique uh, to us as humans. You know, if you even take that point that you just made 
and you distill it down to just something even more simple that's important to people's lives, I'm thinking about the fact that even when you join up with a group of, ma of friends and you decide to go on a walk in the afternoon, you are joining in solidarity in your friendship. And one of the things that I know that has made a huge difference in my life, and it's one of the many reasons why I wanted to talk to you, is when I moved to this new area just uh, a year or so ago, it was forming a walking group with other women that had moved to the area that made me feel suddenly more connected. It made me feel more optimistic. It made me feel uh, a little bit more excited about being in some place new. And so I hadn't thought that much about the fact that walking is something that we've done our whole lives. It's something we do in political protest. It's something that we do to form friendships. And that that is one of the many, many profound reasons why it's an important part of everybody's life. But your book has also dug into what I think is jaw-dropping science about a simple walk. So before we kind of dig into all of it, can you talk a little bit about that 2018 study that tracked participants' activity levels and personality traits over 20 years and how walking had impacted people over time? Um, one is one that looked at inactivity over time. And this was a, a U.S. study, uh, a so-called panel study tracking changes in personality and correlating those with activity or inactivity. And the bottom line is very, very simple, that people who spend increasing periods of time being sedentary as they as they move along in life, it's not a question of getting older. This can be a midlife, uh, you know, um, they tend to show changes in their personality, which are, uh, for want of a better phrase, uh, tending them towards being more asocial, being less open to experience and probably experiencing more by way of negative emotion uh, compared to people who uh, are who get up and get out and get moving. Uh, the other study that I'm thinking of is, is one that was uh, conducted just a couple of years ago um, in older people, uh, people in their late 60s and early 70s. And uh, that study, uh, again, a, a beautiful US study um, conducted in the Chicago area, showed uh, very uh, clearly that uh, if you are inactive, there are negative changes in the brain compared okay. to people who are active. And uh, the changes that are positive in the brain from activity arise from getting up and moving and getting out and going for a good walk. Uh, so the, the intervention is a very simple intervention. It's to go for a, a, a walk three times a week for a couple of miles uh, along with uh, a walking partner and, and uh, a physiotherapist. And uh, what you see in the group that are active is brain changes that are really remarkable. You get an increase in, in the volume of certain brain regions that are concerned with memory. And you also get changes in uh, uh, the effectiveness, uh, for want of a better phrase, of the memory that's supported by those uh, brain regions. Uh, whereas the people who are sitting at home uh, not active they're showing a, a greater decline than they need to do or than the, a, if they had been active over that period of time. So the key point here to, to really to drag out is that yeah. being active positively supports good things about your personality, but it also reaches across to cognitive function. It supports positive things about memory function, and it helps you resist the trajectory of decline that you would have uh, if you just are sitting on your couch doing the Homer Simpson eating a bag of potato chips and watching telly. I think that most of us underestimate what's actually happening in our bodies and in our minds when we're walking. And so let's break it down. What happens in the brain when you go for a walk? Yeah. So I, I think there's a, a couple of things to think about here and it, it really depends on the level of analysis that you want to to, to start at. So let's make it kind of very simple. So Love I'm it. sitting here at home and I, I want to go to the shop. So the, the first thing that you have to do is form the intention that you're going to go and get up and do something. <laughs> yes. That could be because somebody's bleeped you or phoned you or whatever to say to come and meet them at the shop, or you realize you need to go and pick up a pint of milk or whatever it happens to be. Um, so what does that do? Well, the, the first thing is you have to stand up, you have to get up, you have to engage in preparatory movement in order to walk. 
that's a challenge for your brain. Uh, sitting or lying down in a chair is, or being recumbent in a chair is, is not a challenge. Standing up, maintaining balance, uh, and then having directed coherent motion in the direction that you want to go is also a challenge to your brain. So the, the key point here is that movement, uh, and the movement in this case we're talking about, of course, is walking, uh, acts as a positive spur to the brain. And rhythms that are would be quiescent in the brain uh, are suddenly alive. They, 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 come, uh, they, they become very apparent. Um, so in order to get to the shop, you have to orient your body in the correct uh, direction. You have to create a cognitive map of the environment that you're in. These are all subtle, small challenges, but the brain benefits from these. And then let's say you are actually going to the shop and it happens to be up a hill uh, for the sake of this uh, uh, point. Uh, well, then th there are other challenges happening as well. So you have to calibrate your walking speed so that you're at a speed that's comfortable for you. That means you have to step up your heart rate a little. You have to increase your breathing a little. Your musculature has to respond to all of those things. So you've got a whole load of top-down signals from the brain acting as a challenge to the body to get it moving. And then you get to the shop, you do what you got to do, and then you, you walk home again. You might have to carry something. So that's actually uh, a good challenge for you as well. So, you know, even at those kinds of simple levels, um, you can see changes across a whole range of things from, as I said, from the, the kind of top down commands that are coming from the brain all the way down to your foot hitting the ground and uh, you levering yourself off and moving off. I'm really curious to hear what you think of our topic because you and I are going to dig into the science of walking. Yep, <laughs> you heard it. We're going to talk about the extraordinary benefit to your mind, body, and spirit 